The Lord is good, and we're going to be strengthened by him today. I know there's lots of things going on with a lot of people, so we're just going to be around the word today, and hopefully we'll be encouraged. Uh, let's begin with number 275, 275, and we're going we're gonna to surrender all to the Lord, number 275. <laughs> For our announcements today from our bulletin, a <clears throat> number of things I'll mention. Um, <clears throat> I'll sort of go from the reverse and work, work my way up. Uh, the new church directories are available in the foyer, so if you'd like one, pick one up today, the new directory. Um, <clears throat> we've been receiving some bids on the Parsonage AC, so just that's the update on that, and uh, just continue to... Uh, uh, pray that we'll have wisdom on what direction you would have us to go regarding that. And yes, yes, I know it's stunning, but even in this heat, it keeps on running. It does. It's still running. It's still running. But All right. Uh, don't forget, Thursday prayer meeting is Thursday at 630, and uh, this week we're going to look at the Apostles Commissioned. We're almost at the end of the Gospel of John. So we're gonna, that's our next study about the apostles. Uh, next Sunday, this is the big one, next Sunday will be our church-wide potluck luncheon. And uh, please be sure to uh, make it next Sunday. There's going to be a special celebration as well. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's going to be that going on also. Next Sunday, our potluck luncheon after our morning service. Um, let's see. And then also there are some resources in the foyer. Um, there's daily breads available. There's a prayer guide available. Also a New King James study Bible. I have lots of those study Bibles, so please help yourself for those. And then um, keep some folks in prayer as well. Um, I miss, uh, Miss Louise is going to be traveling. Mr. Fred's going to be traveling. As you know, some of these folks do travel each summer. Get out of the heat. Um, maybe that's a good idea, huh? <laughs> but anyway... And then also keep some other folks in prayer just regarding various family issues and various things going on. We need lots of prayer, lots of prayer at this time. So let's pray, and then we'll sing our next song. Gracious Father, we thank you and praise you this wonderful day, this Lord's Day. We can come before you and worship you and praise you, learn of your word, be strengthened and encouraged. Lord, we just pray now that you will uphold the families of our church many various things going on, various issues people are facing. We pray you'll give strength, guidance, and wisdom, and most of all, Lord, your presence and your peace. We pray now that as we continue to be in this place today, we would know your presence 
know your grace. And Lord, we would know the, your Holy Spirit in our heart today. We pray it now, but the name and the power of Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Number 159. Number 159. <laughs> I know that's a hymn that we usually sing it in the Easter Resurrection Weekend, but, but, what rule says you can't sing that on another day? There's no rule that says that. We can even sing Christmas carols in July if we wanted to. No rule says we can't. Okay, all right. Well, for our word for today, it's going to be from 1 John, not the Gospel of John, the Epistle of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 starting at verse 28, reading to chapter 3 and verse 3. So 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 28. The Apostle John writes these words, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. All right, today we're going to do testimonies of praise or thanksgiving or prayer. Who would like to begin today with a testimony for us today? Amen. Amen. All right. Go ahead. I've been struggling with something for a couple of months now, and I'm asking for prayer that God's will be done and not mine. It's kind of hard to deal with. 
Well, let's, uh, let, let's pray for Julie on this. For, Let's pray. Gracious Father, we want to thank you for Julie, her love for you and love for this church. Now we pray you'll uphold her by your grace, giving her wisdom, guidance, and your will to be accomplished in these situations that are before her. May she rest in your peace. May she rest in your comfort. May she rest in the knowledge that, Lord, you have all of this. We pray you'll guide her in her heart and her mind, we pray, by your Holy Spirit. In Christ's holy name, amen. Someone else today, would you like to say a word? pray for them too in just a moment. Yep, yep. Someone else today? Go ahead, yes, yes. Someone else today? Okay.
when Miss Diona was mentioning about, um, you know, your brother and that, uh, you know, what you said, you've been incarcerated for 10 years. Yeah. Um, I have a, uh, a chaplain clerk currently. He's been with me a couple months now. He's working out really well. And, uh, but obviously, as you can, as you can well imagine, um, you know, we work every day together in my office and we go around the yard various times. We call them field trips. And, uh, but um, he's been uh, incarcerated for almost 19 years. And uh, he's going to be released in about maybe four and a half. Um, but I, I just mentioned because, yeah, he mentioned the same thing. And uh, now there's just in conversations, there's been various things he has mentioned. He says, oh, yeah, you know, this happened when I, you know, got incarcerated. And in other words, times have changed. And it's true. It's true. Times have changed. And we don't always think about that, you know, uh, and it's true. So many of these fellas uh, and ladies, too, but many of these guys have been in uh, prison for a number of years. And, you know, we go on with our daily lives, you know what I'm saying? But they're in a place where almost to a degree, time stops, if you know what I'm saying. And it's all different when they went in and then when they come out. It's true. It's true. It is different. So he's mentioned the same thing. And, it, and I've, I've verified various things here and there. Say, so, yeah, uh, that's not the way it is anymore. And so on. It's true. It's true. So, and, and that's one of the things that also we try to do, um, and not so much me directly, because um, the way the department works is that everybody has sort of their own lane, if you will, and we're not supposed to cross over too much. And so, in other words, the rehabilitation and the reentry is more along the lines of programs than it is religion. It's more that than it is what I do. There's a little bit of overlap, but not much. And uh, because when these guys come out, um, you know, many times they have next to nothing. You know, I mean, you know, they, they may have jobs and all that, but they get paid like 35 cents an hour. I mean, that's it. We're not talking $25 an hour. You know, they, so they have little or nothing when they come out. And uh, so that's where we try to help them, rehabilitation, reentry to be able to have them have a, a new life and not come back. That's the thing. And that's what any, any of the fellows that I work with, if, if and when they're going to be released, um, that's one of the things I tell them, and not in a mean way. I just say, well, you know, very good. You're going to be released next week. And I always tell them, I don't want to see you back. I don't want to see you back. You know, and... Uh, so, all right, so let's pray about a couple of these items, and then we'll sing our next song for today. Gracious Father, we praise you that we can come before you at any time individually, but also collectively as a body of believers. I thank you for each one that is here today, and I thank you that we can join our hearts and minds together in prayer and pray for some of these items. Father, we think of Diona's brother who's been incarcerated for a number of years now, we pray that as he's about to be released, you would guide his heart, his mind, his spirit. You lead him to the people he needs to, to be in contact with so that he'll be able to start a new life and not return uh, to the prison system, but to be able to live for Jesus, to uh, have, a, have a positive testimony. And Lord, just pray you'll give him strength, give the family strength as well as they look to assist him also in these days. Father, for Jean and Helen, we can lift them up to you. Father, it seems that you have allowed various things to come into their life that has changed the circumstance completely. We pray for them now, asking for your will to be accomplished. Give them wisdom. Give them guidance of this potential move now to another area. And Father, continue to provide for their needs. May they know that we love them and that we I uh, have, have been blessed by their uh, ministry here. And uh, Lord, as they potentially go to another area, may you continue to guide them in all things. And they know your presence and your grace. We thank you, Lord. We can pray for these peoples. May you now continue to receive of our worship and show us now your holy word. In the name and power of Christ Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. All right.
right, uh, number 478, before we look at the word today. 478. today from 1 John 2, 28 to 3, 3. And actually, we're just going to look at one verse today. It's 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I started a new series for the summer, a summer series. And this summer series is called Standing Firm. Today, it's going to be preparing for difficult days. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the Spirit of the Lord has an amazing way of guiding our hearts and our minds. And I truly believe the Lord has guided me to share this with you on this particular day. So I said, preparing for difficult days. Four things. The first one is this, doing things my way. As we begin, as we look at this one verse from verse 28 of 1 John 2, you notice he says, John writes this, and now. Just those two words, and now. In other words, what John is saying is this, okay? This is what John is saying. He says, and now. Or in other words, he says, in light of what I just told you, what should you do? That's what he means by those two words, and now, okay? So in light of what I just told you, okay, this is what you're going to see. This is what's going to occur. Now, this is what you need to to do. And so, what does John say? He says, again, I'm going to explain it this way, in light of what I just wrote to you, now, little children, this is what you need to do. And he says, abide in him. Now, that may seem real simple. What this means is <clears throat> to remain in him. Remain in Christ. May I put it another way? When difficult days occur, simply stay with it. Stay with it. That's what John is saying to the believers. Stay with it. You see, it's very tempting. That's why number one is doing things my way. It's very tempting. It's very, very tempting when things don't go my way. It's very tempting to think, what can I do? That's usually one of our first thoughts. When things don't go my way, what can I do? When things aren't going my way, it's very easy to say, well, what can I do? change. And when things aren't going the way I want to see them go, it's very easy to say to myself, how am I going to make it happen? It's real easy, it's real tempting to start thinking that way. And I know you know this, because all of us here today 
we're all going to have days and times and situations where it's not going to go the way you want. That's true. It's not going to go the way you want. This does happen. This is why John says, abide in him. That's why John says, remain in Christ. Now, why is that? Why remain in Christ? Why keep your trust in Jesus? Why continue to be confident in Jesus? Very simple. You see, it's not complicated. And I want to encourage you, it's really not complicated. We make it complicated. We do, as humans. We try to think of this and think of that and figure this out and figure that out. We try to do this. We try to do this. It's really not complicated. But John says, continue to, to remain in Jesus, continue to increase the trust and the confidence because, because here it is, no matter how bad things get, our God is always in complete control. Always. Now, do you, now, now you don't have to answer. Think of it, though. Think of it. Do you truly believe that? Do you truly believe that? That as bad as anything gets, God is still in complete control. Now, may I say, it's easy for us here at this moment in this place with nice AC. <clears throat> it's easy for us, isn't it? Isn't it? It's easy for us at this moment to say, oh, yes, I believe God's always in control. Okay, but what happens Wednesday afternoon? or Friday morning, or whatever day, or what happens at, at 2 a.m. some night when things aren't going your way? What happens when your AC goes out? You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> See? What happens then? What happens when your AC goes out? What happens when you get a blown out tire on the same day? What happens when when something else happens? Hmm. Is God still in control then? Is he? The truth is, he still is. He still is. And that's why I challenge us. That's why I challenge our thinking. Challenge the thinking. Do you truly believe God is still in control? I want to encourage you. This day, this day, we can have complete confidence. Complete confidence that God is working his purposes. He is. See, God is always working. Did you know that? He is always working. See, you and I need to have rest, don't we? We do. We can only work so long. You know what I'm saying? We need to rest. And we, and we, always, we can't always be doing everything every time. We can't. We can't. We're humans. We have limitations mentally, emotionally, Physically, we have limitations. God doesn't. God doesn't take vacations. He doesn't. God doesn't say, excuse me, hold on just a minute now. I can't deal with you. I'm dealing with this over here. God doesn't do that. We do that all the time, don't we? We do. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Yep, I got a chaplain clerk now. So you know what? 
anybody that comes to the gate, I send him out. You go see what he wants. <laughs> you know, and sometimes there's some days in which, no, I can't see you today. That's true. But no, God never does that. We can come to the Lord God in prayer anytime, can't we? Anytime, day, night, doesn't matter. That's awesome. Did you know that? That's awesome. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, what situation you're facing. You can always come to God in prayer. I want to encourage you. That's the kind of relationship we need to have with our Lord God, isn't it? See, sometimes we go down the theological path and we say, oh, yes, I believe God's presence is everywhere. Well, think of it. If God's presence is everywhere, that means he's with you, right? Everywhere you go, he's with you, isn't he? Everywhere. His power, his authority, his grace, his peace, it's always there. That's awesome. See, that's the confidence we can have in Jesus. That's the confidence. That's the confidence. We can be assured. And here's the thing. We can be assured that God's purposes are best. We can be assured of that. See, God doesn't always explain to you and me everything he's doing every moment of every day. He doesn't explain it to us. But we can be assured that his purpose is the best one. And the reason why we can be assured of that is because of God's holy character. See, you and I change, don't we? We change. Where you were, let's say, five years ago, mentally and emotionally, is probably not where you are today. And where you were, let's say, 20 years ago, if you're even that old, <laughs> but, you know, where you were a, f a number of years ago is probably not where you are now, is it? That's all true. See, we change. We change. God never changes. His holiness, is his holy character was the same with, with Samuel, with David, with Elijah, with Moses, with Abraham. It's the same holy God. It's the same powerful God. It's the same gracious God. He never changes. That's why we can be totally, absolutely assured his purpose is the best one. We can be assured of that. See, as humans, our minds, you know, we, 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 we don't always, let's, let's put it this way, we don't always have the purest motive, do we? Not always. Sometimes, sometimes we allow ourselves to, to do different things for different reasons. Sometimes that's true. But God never has an unpure motive. God never has an unpure thought in that way. God never has an unpure purpose. God's purposes are always best. We can have complete confidence in that. Number two, second guessing God. The next words we see is this, that when he appears, notice what the scripture says, that when he appears, not if, it's when. It's when. See, the first century Christians, they knew of Jesus' return. They knew of it. They understood it. They looked for his return. You know, what, you know what I've noticed? I've noticed that through the centuries... And, well, let me back that up a little bit. Through the decades, let me put it that way. Through the decades, I've noticed that various times, various Christians will have various views regarding on what, regard, uh, have various views regarding future events, depending on what's going on at the time. 
I've noticed this. For example, for example, years and years ago, you remember a time called the 1920s. Now, most of us probably weren't born yet. We're not that old. But in the 1920s, okay, and here's the thing, it was nicknamed the Roaring Twenties. That was the nickname of that time period, the Roaring Twenties. Industry was taking off, industrialization, um, uh, you know, many various things were, were occurring. You know, the economy was good at that time, and uh, taxes were low at that time, and so forth. Oh, yeah, I mean, the Roaring Twenties, it was a great time, so it seemed. And so at that time of the 1920s, there was a very, very popular eschatological view regarding the future events. Eschatology is a theological term that refers to the study of revelation and the study of future events. That's what eschatology is. And at that time, the 1920s, the popular eschatological view was post-millennialism. That was real popular in the 1920s. Post-millennialism teaches that due to the evangelistic efforts of the church, things are getting better and better and better to the point where we will usher in the millennial reign of Christ. That's what post-millennialism teaches. And it was very popular in the 1920s because things were going well financially, economically, socially, all this. It was going really well until 1929. And if anybody knows history, which you should know history, you should, you should know your history. 1929 was the major stock market crash and everything crashed. Everything did. And then in the 1930s, we know it was the Depression. And it was also nicknamed the Dirty 30s. People were in soup lines and there was unemployment and all this was going on in the 30s, the 1930s. Very interesting that after the 1920s, the view of post-millennialism was basically gone. See, that in the 20s, they all believed that we're going to usher in the millennial kingdom. And then all this crashed. That view wasn't popular. Wasn't, that view went by the wayside. Today, there's very few people that hold to post-millennial. But in our time today, you know what I've noticed? Okay. And see, this is the trends. Okay. These are the trends that I observe. Here's the trend now. You know what the popular view is now? The popular view now is the ah millennial. It's the letter A and then millennial, and it's pronounced ah millennial. Ah millennial is the popular view today. That's the popular one now. In the last, let's say, 25, 30 years, that's the popular one now. And ah millennial basically teaches this, that revelation has already occurred. It's already happened. And they, they claim, like when, when the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70, that's what they refer it to. That, that's what happened. That's what, that's what Revelation is all referring to, the Romans destroying the temple in AD 70. That's what they say it refers to. And they spiritualize all the different verses in Revelation. And all millennial teaches that we just go along like this, and then the rapture, and then the eternal ages. That's it. We just go to be with the Lord. That's it. That's the end of it. That's all millennial. And what they do with Revelation and the tribulation period and all this sort of stuff that we know Revelation teaches, they spiritualize all the verses. That's what they do. And they say, oh, no, that doesn't mean that. It means this. That doesn't refer to this. It refers to this. And they, they, so they, they, they take it all apart. That's what they do. That's the popular view today. That's the popular view today, that revelations already happened. But here's two things to keep in mind. Number one is this. God's holy word 
has never been wrong. It's never been wrong. When God said there would be, when God told Noah there would be a flood, wasn't there a flood? Yeah, there was. And by the way, you can look at civilizations and countries and, 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 and places all around the world, all around, and cultures all around the world. Everybody verifies there was a flood. Everybody verifies it. Everybody does. When God said there would be a flood, there was a flood. When God said, I'm going to bring down the walls of Jericho, didn't the walls of Jericho come down? They sure did. When God said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, wasn't the Messiah born in Bethlehem? Yes, he was. You see? And then just picking off a few. Okay? God's word has never, ever been wrong. It's always been fulfilled. Now, a second thing is this. Let us not also forget, God does not operate on my timetable. He doesn't operate on my timetable. And he doesn't do what I think he should do when I think he should do it. God doesn't do that. <clears throat> I know there's a bunch of immorality going on, and so do you. I know there's a bunch of hypocrisy going on, and so do you. And if we had our way, we'd wipe out half of the country right now. <clears throat> if we had our way. Yeah, we would. We'd wipe them all out. <clears throat> but you see, God doesn't operate on my timetable. God doesn't do what I think should be done. Remember what I said a little while ago? God is working his purpose. And his purpose isn't always my purpose. It's not. It's not always. You know that when John wrote this, there were also difficult days in the first century as well. There was. Sometimes we look at the scriptures and we, and we think of, you know, the, the, the disciples and the apostles and, you know, the establishment of the early church in the book of Acts. Sometimes we think, oh, well, huh, they had it easy. Oh, no, they did not. No, they did not. No, they didn't. What did they do to Jesus that crucified him? That's why the disciples were a little bit afraid. Jeez, I don't know. Do I want to be lined up with this fella? They might come after me. That's what they were thinking. There was difficult times in the early church too. There was in the first century, just like today. See, this is where, and this is where faith comes in. This is where faith comes in. I encourage you today to increase your confidence in God. Increase your confidence in God. Increase your confidence in God that he is true and he is just. Because he is. Increase your confidence in God that he will fulfill what he has said. So, Here's a case in point. Okay? I've mentioned this before, and you've read it before. Read it again. Matthew chapter 6. Here's your homework. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 33. You can read those this week. And what that tells us is that God will provide for you. That's what God says. That's what God says. He will provide for you. Now, will he do it the way you want? Maybe, and maybe not. Will he provide exactly what you think? Maybe, maybe not. Will he do it in the time you think? Maybe, and maybe not. But God will provide. That is his promise. 
And I want to encourage you, be confident in what God has said. Be confident in what God has said. You see, our governmental leaders, they say a lot of stuff, don't they? They do. They say a lot of stuff. And when it comes toward, when it comes up to an election, as you know, we have an election coming up. Oh, they say a whole bunch of stuff, don't they? They do, don't they? They say a whole bunch of stuff all of the time. <clears throat> and let's be honest. I'm just going to say it straight. We all know they're liars. <clears throat> it's true. I'm just telling you the truth. It's true. God is not a liar. If God says he will do this, he will do it. If God says he'll provide this, he'll provide it. If God says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. That's why I say God's word is absolutely true. You can have complete confidence in God, in his word, in Jesus, and in his spirit. Because God will never, ever, ever fail you. He will never fail you. I'll fail you. The leadership board of this church will fail you. Because all we are are humans. We will fail. Our governmental leaders will fail. You're like, well, geez, yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> it is. They're going to fail, too. God never fails. That's the confidence we can have. See, our God, has not he fulfilled his holy word up to this point? He has, hasn't he? Everything God has said, he's fulfilled it. Everything. Everything. We've been going through the Gospel of John on Thursday night. In the Gospel of John, didn't Jesus say, I need to go away now, but I'm going to send my Holy Spirit? Didn't Jesus send the Holy Spirit? He did, didn't he? He did. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't say, well, I'm going to go away now and send my Holy Spirit. And then Jesus says, aha, gotcha. He didn't, see, he didn't do that. He said, I'm going to send my spirit. And he did. And he did. And the same thing with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is, is also all truth. Because what does the Holy Spirit do? He teaches us the truth of the scriptures, doesn't he? He does. That's no lie. I believe it's in Titus. I think it's in Titus where the scripture says, God cannot lie. It says it in Titus. Yeah. That's why we can have complete and absolute confidence in God this day. So, before we move on to number three, if God has fulfilled his word up to this point, if he has done that, then why would God suddenly stop doing that? Why would he? He's not going to. Because that is his character, you see. As you go through the words and you read the scriptures and get to know it better, you'll see that is the consistent character of God. Did not God lead the Israelites out of Egypt? He did. Did not God, what did God do? Did not he provide for them in the desert for 40 years? He did, didn't he? He provided for them. And you know what astounds me? To this day, it astounds me. The Bible says they were in the desert for 40 years and their clothes didn't wear out. That is awesome, isn't it? Some of us, we have to replace our shoes every six months, isn't it? <clears throat> their clothes didn't wear out. That's what it says, over 40 years worth, but didn't wear out. God promised that and he did it. That's, see, that's the character of God. That, who, that is who and what he is. And I say all that because, you see, each day when we face things, each day when things come into our lives, 
Each day when we th see things around us that are falling apart, we can have complete confidence that God is in complete control. We can have that confidence. That's the confidence that God wants to build in us today. That's why John says, abide in him that when he appears. Now, number three is this. We're not alone. The next words are very impacting. Okay? We'll start at the beginning. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, now here's our next phrase, we may have confidence. We may have confidence. <clears throat> Think about it. How much confidence, and only you can answer this. Think about it. How much confidence do you have in God? How much do you have? How much confidence do you have in God? Now, I hear different things on the news like you do. And I hear them say, well, climate change and all this nonsense. And I hear them talk about the sun heating up and all this stuff. Listen, you know what I believe? I believe God is in control, not man. And if it's God's will that this earth continue around the sun, guess what? It's going to do it. And I believe if it's God's will for the, the moon to go around the, you know, the earth, guess what? It's going to happen. You see? That's, what that's the confidence we have in God, that he is in complete control. Regardless of what they say, regardless of what they say, regardless of what he says, God is in control, not this person. Not the scientists, not the politicians. God's in control. Not all these people. God's in control. He's in control. Not these people. That's why I, I don't have any worries about that. There's some people that worry about this, isn't there? There is. There's some people that worry about this. We don't have to worry about it. God's in control. Complete. Not only that, but how much confidence? Think about how much confidence do you have in his holy word? How much confidence do you have? I encourage you, challenge you. You should have complete confidence in God's holy word. You should. And you can. Think of it this way, okay? The Word of God was completed by uh, the Apostle John when he wrote the book of Revelation at the island of Patmos. He finished it up. That was over 2,000 years ago. How many changes have been in the, in the Scriptures since then? The answer is none. Zero. There's been no changes. No changes at all. The Word of God is the same as it was then, as it is now. No changes. I'm not going to name the book, but there's a book. There's a book by another religious group. In the last 80 years, there's been over 4,000 changes. Over 4,000 changes. Every time they get a new president, they change things. It's true. I'm not making this stuff up. It's true. But here it is. Has the Word of God changed? Nope. Not a bit. You can have absolute, complete confidence in God's holy Word today. Just like John did. Just like the, the, just like the theologians before us. Sure. Complete confidence in it today. Complete confidence. God's Word will instruct you today. God's Word will encourage your heart today. God's Word will strengthen your heart today. It will. That's why it's so important that we are in God's Word daily. That's why. That's why. <clears throat> Let me say a couple more. How much confidence do you have in Jesus today? 
how much confidence? You should have absolute, complete confidence in Jesus. You should. Okay, number one, for your salvation. Okay, I believe that when Jesus said, when he was on the cross, I believe when Jesus said, it is finished, I believe he meant what he said. You don't have to do anything else to earn your salvation. Not at all. If you have repented of sin and received Christ as Savior, you're a believer in Christ. Case closed. Done deal. Because it's not based on you. It's based on what Jesus did. That's what it's based in. That's why you can have complete confidence. The blood of Jesus doesn't change. Doesn't he still save people today? Sure he does. You can have complete confidence in Jesus today. You can have complete confidence in Jesus today that he has absolute power, control, and authority over all the demons run around as well. Remember in the, New Te remember in the Gospels when Jesus cast out demons? Guess what? It's the same Jesus, isn't it? It is. Isn't it the same power? It is. Isn't it the same authority? It is. It's the same authority. That's why you can have complete confidence in Jesus. And last but not least, how about this? How much confidence do you have in God's ability to fulfill the future? Mm. See, sometimes we're okay with all of this, aren't we? We believe in the apostles. You know what I'm saying? We believe in the word of God. We believe in the early church. We believe in the scriptures. But then when we switch it over to the future, we're like, ooh, uh, gee, well, I don't know. And we kind of wonder. Oh, wait a minute. If God, was, if God was faithful with Moses, if he was faithful with David, if he was faithful with Peter and John and the apostle Paul, if he was faithful with them, he'll be faithful with you tomorrow. He will be. Why? Because God doesn't change. See? He doesn't change. He will be faithful. That's why you can have complete confidence in God's ability to fulfill the future. You can have that. <clears throat> See, we can easily, we can easily get discouraged. We can easily get distracted by all that we see going on around us. That can, that can easily influence us at different times. It can, it can. But I want to submit to you to take a different view, and that's this. Instead of today's unholy attitudes, instead of today's unholy actions, defeating our spirit. Let us choose to have the present darkness strengthen our resolve in Jesus' return. That's what we need to do. That's why he says, we may have confidence. That's what John is saying. We may have confidence. If God, okay, if God's already fulfilled his word, if he already has, then what's he said? Jesus is coming. And if he's already fulfilled it here, he'll fulfill it here. See? You can have confidence that Jesus is coming. That's the confidence that we can have. Now, I want to show you something else. You know, we're not the only ones. Okay, we, we think things are bad and things are wrong and things are immoral and things are unholy <clears throat> and things are, 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 are illegal and all this. Well, it may be all true, but I tell you, we're not the only ones. We are not the only ones that faced such unrestrained culture. No, we're not. We're not the only ones. Sometimes we have this idea that, you know, right from Genesis, right up through, everything was holy until today. 
That is not true. That is not true. Because guess what? God creates everything in chapter 1. He creates man in chapter 2. Oh, sin comes in in chapter 3. And guess what? Chapter 4 is the first murder. Four chapters into Genesis, we get the first murder. And then by chapter 6, by chapter 6 of Genesis, you know what God says? Oh, man, i got to eliminate this place. That's what God says, isn't it? That's what it says, right? That's what it says in chapter 6. Read it. Genesis chapter 6. There's 50 chapters in Genesis. By chapter 6, God's, you know what God says in chapter 6? He says, man, I am sorry that I made man. That's what God says. It's right there in the Bible. You can read it. By Genesis chapter 6, he's sorry he made man. And we think we're so unholy now, it was just as bad then. It was just as bad. It was. And you know what happened? It's called the flood. And God eliminated everybody. Except for eight people. Yeah, eight people. That's it. And by the way, I can tell you, there was more than 20 people, too. It wasn't 8 billion, but there was more than 20. Only 8 people. Now, why do I say all that? Because, because, okay, we won't turn there because it's a whole book. But, you know, in 2 Kings, now there's a place you don't go to often. In 2 Kings, the scripture indicates that many, many Many of the kings of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. In Second Kings. Oh yeah. You see, the Israelites, the Israelites are not great people. They weren't in the scriptures. The Bible says they disobeyed God all the time. And Israel said to the Lord, God said, look, these other nations, they got kings. We want a king too. And God says, well, I'm your king. Nah, don't matter. We want a king. So God said, okay. And there were several kings, first and second kings, the two books. But in second kings, if you decide to read through that someday, you'll see many, many of the Israel kings, that's what the Bible says, did evil in the sight of the Lord did evil they dishonored God they took advantage of the people they did this in 2nd Kings now there's a reason why I had said number 3 is we're not alone because there was also in now I don't mention 2nd Kings but in 1st Kings in 1 Kings, there's a fellow by the name of Elijah. Remember him? And Elijah faced the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. See, there was evil going on then. And Elijah faced the prophets of Baal. <laughs> now, we're not alone because in 1 Kings 19, 18... As I'm getting over there, Elijah, he thought after he defeated the the prophets of Baal, with of course the power of the Lord, Elijah thought that he was alone. That's what he thought. But in First Kings 19:18, God says this: Yet I have reserved seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. God reserves 7,000. I say that because to this very day, God is with us. And we are not alone. Look at it this way. All of us here this morning, we're all believers in Christ. Are we alone? No. No. You're not alone. 
You have brothers and sisters in Christ who will pray for you, uphold you, uplift you, encourage you. See, we are not alone. So you know what the enemy tries to do? The enemy tries to do three things. He tries to put fear in your heart. He tries to get you alone. And he tries to get you to doubt God. Those are the three things he tries to do. Those are the three things he tries to get you to do. Okay? Have fear. Be alone. And, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, what was the other one? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and doubt. Yeah, those are the three things he tries to get you to do. So when you're feeling alone, remember, you're not alone. You have brothers and sisters in Christ. When he gets you to doubt God, remember, God is in complete control. He's fulfilled everything. When he tries to strike fear into your heart, that's when you have strengthened of the Lord, you see. That's what he tries to do. We're not alone. Number four today in preparing for difficult days, truth wins out. Truth wins out. As we continue to be closer to Christ's return, okay, the closer we get to Jesus' return, the closer we get to it, we're going to continue to see attitudes of entitlement. We will. That's the big, that's the, that's the, that's sort of the catchphrase today, isn't it? Entitlement. We're going to see more and more of this as we get closer to the return of Jesus. So I get less, going to get more. That's what God's word says. As we continue to get closer to Christ's return, we're going to see more of a disregard for God's kindness. And we're going to see more, okay, as we get closer to the, to the return of Christ. We're going to see more of the world's culture honoring the shameful. We're going to see more of it. We're going to see more of it. And the more we get closer to the return of Jesus, we're going to see more people refusing to change. Refusing to change. And may I say one more? As we get closer to Jesus' return, we're going to see more becoming more aggressive toward God. We're going to see that. You see, remember what I mentioned a little while ago? Post-millennialism? Things get better and better and better because of the church? Do we see that happening? No, we don't. We don't see it getting better and better. Because God's word says in 2 Timothy 3, is a good, is a good chapter to read on that. We're going to see that as, it can, as we get closer to Jesus, these things are going to increase. They're going to increase more. Vance Havner was a pastor years ago. Okay, some of you may remember that name. <clears throat> Vance Havner. Now, this isn't recent. Okay, this quote I'm going to give to you is not recent. Vance Havner was a pastor years ago. Not in the 1800s, but, but, but not, not quite that long. But this was years ago. And he said this. Vance Havner said this. He says, people used to blush when ashamed. Now they're ashamed to blush. He says, modesty has disappeared and a brazen generation with no fear of God mocks at sin. Wow. Sounds like you're talking about today, doesn't it? Sounds like it. But this was years ago that he made that quote. Hmm. My brothers and sisters in the Lord today, it is in the midst of this very generation today that we must hold fast to the standard of truth. We must. We must. Regardless of what the media says, regardless of what the culture says, regardless of what the politicians say, we have to hold fast to the standard of truth. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. 
If God says it's improper, it's improper. We need to hold fast. And there's going to be lots of pressure. Believe me, there's going to be lots of pressure on us individually and even collectively as a church. There will be pressure. And say, look, you need to get up with modern times. Don't, don't listen to this dusty book. You need to get up in modern times. You need to be progressive in your thinking. That's what they'll tell us. Yeah, they're progressing all right. Not in the path of righteousness, in the path of unholiness. Let me say this. Just because the government says that this is now legal doesn't mean that God says it's right. It doesn't mean that. See, and that's what our culture is doing. They're saying because the legislature passes a law and says it's right, oh, well, I guess it's right now. No, it's not right. It's still unholy. It's still unrighteous. It's still against the commands of God. And that's where we need to stand firm on the standard of truth. And as long as I continue to teach the word here at this church, that's what I'm going to be doing. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. If God says word is an abomination, guess what? It's an abomination. And that's the way it's going to be. We cannot compromise the truth of the Holy Word. Can't do it. Can't do it. I have a friend of mine in which his wife worked for a company, a Dutch company, and they would do a couple trips a year. And she was over in Netherlands, I think, and she obviously talks to the various coworkers and so forth from that area and all that. And oh yeah, yeah, it was indicated to her that that over in Europe, people don't even get married anymore. They don't. Don't even get married anymore. Yeah, that's gone by the wayside. See, now, European nations are a little bit ahead of North America. But you notice it's coming to this shore, isn't it? It's coming over here. See what I'm saying? See, that's what the world does. The world goes in these directions. And the world says, oh, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Just go ahead and do this. And, and see what I'm saying? And people... People think that because everybody's doing it, it must be right. No, it's not. It's not right. It's not. Just because everybody says it's right doesn't mean it's right. If the scripture is true, and it is, We believe it to be true. That means the return of Jesus is closer than it's ever been before. So what that means is that in, with with that thought in mind, the return of Jesus is so close. This should cause us to walk more closely with him today. And by the way, that's where that last phrase comes in. What's it say? We may have confidence now and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Not be ashamed at him before him at his coming. In other words, we should be ready for the return of Jesus. Think about it. Are you Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, are you ready? So I can tell you, when that day comes, it's not going to be, oh, just a minute, I need to take care of this. 
that ain't happening. When we go up with the Lord, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Are you ready for the return of Christ? <clears throat> now, as we finish this up today, let me also say this. As bad as things may seem, notice how I said that. As bad as things may seem, never, ever forget God has set limits. He has set limits. Okay? Two examples come to mind as I turn to another verse. But remember in the first couple of chapters of Job, when God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? And Job said, Well says, you've placed a hedge of protection around him. If you take that away, he'll curse you to your face. And what did God do? I'm sort of paraphrasing. God said, all right, okay. I'll let you do all this stuff you want to do to him, but you will not take his life. See? God set Limits. There's another example. It's in uh, Luke 11, I believe. What did Jesus say to Peter? Jesus said this to Peter. Jesus said, Satan, watch this now. Jesus said to Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you. Hmm. See? Satan asked permission to sift you. See, God sets limits. As bad as it may seem, the things are. Um, by the way, there's also going to come a time when God is going to put an end to all the perversity. Job 38, 11. It's when I said, this far you may come, but no farther. Here your proud waves must stop. There'll be a time when God will put an end <clears throat> to the perversity. So, number four is the truth wins out because the truth will win out. The truth will win out. As I've heard other pastors and theologians put it, in the end, we win. And it's true, because God wins. Do we win? No, God wins. In the end, God wins. So, because it is truth, okay, because it is truth, these things, and we'll, and we'll close in prayer. Because the truth wins out, we can, first, we can stand tall. We don't have to shrink in, uh, in amidst the darkness. Okay? Because remember what we said? Satan tries to bring fear to us. Don't need to, don't need to fear. Stand tall. Secondly, we can also stand true. We can stand true. Okay? The world may be full of liars. It may be. But as long as we stand on truth... We're good. You have nothing to fear when you tell the truth. Isn't that right? You have nothing to fear when you tell the truth. And third thing is, we can stand firm. Now, we can stand tall, stand true, and stand firm. Why? Because God is in control. God is in control. And so, this is how we prepare for difficult days. Whatever you're going to face today, tomorrow, this week, remember, remember our verse today, 1 John 2, 28. God is in total control. All right, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you 
for this verse today. That, Lord, you have shown us truth. You have shown us your will and purposes. You have shown us your strength. You have shown us your character. You have shown us your truth. I pray today we've been strengthened by you today in the things of the Holy Word. That regardless of what you allow us to face, we will know, Lord, that you know all. You're in control of all. And you will uphold us in all these things. It doesn't mean that we won't face disappointment. It doesn't mean that we won't face difficult times. But we'll be prepared to face them in the power of Jesus. We'll be prepared to face them in the power of the Lord our God. And Lord, that we can go through and go forth in the power of our Savior. Bless now these truths to our hearts, we pray, by the name and the power and the grace of Christ Jesus. Amen. Number 61 will be our last song today. Number 61. Gracious Father, we praise you today for your goodness and grace to us through Christ our Lord and his Holy Spirit. We praise you, Lord, that regardless of what we face, who, what, where, and when, you are always with us. Your power and grace go before us. Now, Lord, may you enable us to know your presence today. Go before us in all things. And, Lord, may our lives continue to show forth the light of Christ, the strength of our Savior today. And may we be looking to your return. For we ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen.